Welcome back, everybody, to my continuing series on uh, world government, UFO disclosure activities, and uh, projects. Uh, today's installment will uh, deal and hopefully enlighten you about the efforts of Canada, the U.S. good neighbor to the north, in terms of uh, their efforts to uh, enlighten and educate uh, the public and our civilization and society on the ET, UAP, UFO phenomenon and uh, to help drive the answers to the questions, are we uh, alone in the universe? So let me dive into uh, Canada's efforts here real quick. Uh, first, I will uh, give you a little bit of a history. As with uh, most all of the representative countries as part of this uh, series, Canada has had a very rich history also going back uh, many, many, many decades and actually into a couple of centuries. So uh, amongst the major uh, uh, incidences and sightings in Canada uh, are contained in 1951, there was um, uh, sightings and experience uh, by uh, uh, both U.S. military and uh, Royal uh, Air Can uh, Canada uh, in uh, Gander, Newfoundland. Uh, further on uh, into the 1960s, uh, 1960 in Clan Lake Northwest Territories, there was a, a, a very detailed encounter. 1967 seemed to be a very seminal uh, year in Canada as far as world famous incidences are concerned. Uh, the Falcon Lake Manitoba incident uh, and then uh, later on in October Shag Harbor in Nova Scotia uh, which became really uh, if you can uh, flash back and place yourself within the times in 1967 of the, of the culture and everything back then and all of the covert uh, cover-up activities that went on as a result of uh, this encounter with involvement from Canada, the United States, Russia, and other uh, world uh, military uh, authorities in terms of this week-long incident. Uh, it, it kind of helped shape and define and put Canada on the worldwide map in terms of the uh, UFO UAP phenomena. Uh, later on, 1969, Prince George in British Columbia, and uh, then uh, later, 1975 and uh, 76, uh, again in uh, Manitoba, southern Manitoba, uh, Canadians, uh, the culture is known, uh, these, these events uh, wave. Uh, are known as uh, Charlie Red Star. So uh, uh, my Canadian uh, viewers can uh, uh, reminisce and uh, remember uh, very distinctly the events uh, of those two years during the uh, Manitoba Toba wave. Uh, later on in 1978, uh, Clarenville, Newfoundland and uh, Labrador. 1990, Montreal, uh, Quebec. Uh, Trail BC in uh, 1997. And then uh, into this century, 2010, uh, Harbor Mill in Newfoundland and Labrador once again, and, uh, and Prince Edward Island in 2014, Kensington. Um, many, many, many other uh, events. This is just a, a short summary highlight of some of the more uh, famous and worldwide ones in, uh, in Canada during uh, their history, long history, of uh, UFO, UAP involvement. So, um, in terms of, uh, I'll just mention um, uh, the many contributors and the very important people who uh, have made uh, efforts to uh, study and, and disclose the nature and information and knowledge about the phenomenon. Uh, Canada does have a very rich history and I've been very fortunate to uh, be introduced and to have made friendships and have known uh, at least some of these people anyways. Uh, uh, two very important, the late Stanton Friedman and uh, the late uh, Honorable Paul Hellyer who was uh, Prime Minister of Defense in Canada back in the 1960s. Uh, he uh, later on developed uh, a, a very, well, he, uh, according to knowledge that he had obtained during his many, many decades of government service, became aware of the UFO UAP phenomenon and became a staunch advocate for not only disclosure, but uh, ultimate uh, species and uh, worldwide um, 
uh, recognition that there are other uh, extraterrestrial intelligences out there. So I had the very great privilege of knowing uh, personally these two gentlemen, uh, and, uh, other uh, uh, people who I have um, developed friendships with, Grant Cameron, uh, who is still active in uh, the uh, ufology field, uh, Daniel Aykroyd, the actor, uh, while he is not an active ufologist, he has had a lifelong interest and um, uh, he helped, uh, at least him and his uh, son, helped uh, co-produce the uh, very uh, famous uh, Canadian uh, version in the 1990s television version of the uh, X-Files uh, television program. Uh, Sci Factor Tales of the uh, uh, Paranormal, I believe was the title of that. Uh, other uh, very important contributors uh, to the ufology effort and um, uh, this person, uh, Chris um, Redkowski, who uh, again, another longtime ufologist, but is uh, probably the most um, significant in terms of the actual activities to dis uh, get the Canadian government to disclose uh, their UFO files and documents. Uh, Chris Rutkowski of the Ufology Research uh, of Manitoba, which is where he resides, and he is, has authored many books in regards to the subject. So I'll direct you to his efforts if you want to take a deeper dive into the history and development of Canada's disclosure uh, protocols and uh, and uh, whatnot. So those are just some of the uh, very important uh, people, uh, well known and uh, very significant to the uh, ufology profession. So um, from there, let me uh, mention uh, as uh, if you have been following in my other uh, installments in the series, as we go through uh, our world government surveys, uh, there's varying levels of, uh, of uh, detailed government agency involvement, uh, depending on what country you're talking about. Canada is no exception uh, in terms of the 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 um, uh, the location of UFO UAP files spread across many agencies and departments of the Canadian uh, government and uh, uh, private uh, scientific uh, industry and whatnot. So uh, amongst the agencies involved in Canada, the National Research Council or the NRC, the Department of National Defense, Canadian Department of Transport, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, the Canadian Coast Guard, the Royal Canadian Navy, the Royal Canadian Air Force, and um, uh, there are other minor agencies, but uh, uh, the, the, the extent of the web of involvement uh, cutting across the different, many different agencies is also present uh, within the, the Canadian uh, Canada landscape also. So uh, let me go into now uh, a little bit of the, uh, the provenance of uh, the disclosure uh, project protocol history and development of whatnot. So uh, the, the government uh, in Canada, they, they maintained a long time public advocacy that they didn't want to really get uh, an opinion. They didn't want to really get involved in the UFO UAP study so much. And uh, throughout the, the various years in the 1900s, they made uh, public announcements uh, indicating as such. But uh, they had their own uh, studies uh, 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 of the phenomenon, such as the US did with uh, the United States uh, Project Sign, Project Grudge, Project uh, Blue Book, and uh, fast forward into uh, uh, the uh, Advanced uh, Aerospace Threat Identification Program, the ATIP, and the new uh, Office of uh, Ufology that um, uh, the Depart U.S. Department of Defense is now uh, active and uh, up and running and uh, and providing reports from. But uh, in Canada, there's a similar history and development of the whole thing. Uh, it started right around the time in the U.S. Uh, when uh, Project Sign and Project Grudge uh, were actually done in the late, very late 40s, early 50s. Uh, in 1950 and uh, to 54, to the Department of Transport uh, had, their, uh, had their own studies. Uh, Project Second Story 
was uh, one of the Canadian ones in 1952 that paralleled the same timeline as the U.S.'s Project uh, Blue Book. And then um, Project uh, Magnet was the, uh, the second one that uh, Canada um, uh, actually uh, uh, undertook uh, again in the 1950s. Uh, and, and again paralleled uh, the activities, uh, they kind of went in lockstep with uh, the U.S. Uh, for the Development Project Blue Book and, and whatnot in the studying and whatnot. But uh, as, uh, as happened with Project Blue Book, after a couple of years in the early 1950s, uh, interest uh, kind of began to wane uh, in uh, the public's perception of what the government was doing. Uh, but the government was basically uh, in the U.S. and also in Canada very overwhelmed by the number of reports and uh, the proliferation of the public's reporting of uh, uh, witness uh, reports, occurrences, incidents, and, and encounters, and, and uh, whatnot. It uh, kind of burdened the government, and, and because of the sheer uh, number of reports and activity that were flooding into the governments, uh, uh, and as I just uh, displayed to you here, the many government agencies in Canada that were involved in uh, recording and maintaining archives and documents uh, in, in, in these situations, it just overwhelmed them. So the web of communication uh, became uh, very involved and, and in, in lots of uh, areas broke down. Uh, and, and as you can just maybe picture the development of the, uh, how will I put this, uh, when, when uh, the agencies were, were uh, overwhelmed with new reports and information and, and investigations and whatnot, the abilities for them to effectively communicate and archive uh, these, these reports got uh, disorganized, uh, dis uh, uncurated, so to speak, uh, uh, unorgan disorganized, to where uh, the reports were spread out amongst that many different agencies and there was no administrative oversight with which to be able to catalog and remember all of the reports and all of the information contained within all the government's archives for all of these uh, these reports and situations and whatnot. So, uh, as is characteristic of uh, many uh, efforts in many other countries, it was uh, put upon the public to uh, be able to uh, be the the hound, so to speak, or the policeman uh, uh, badgering. Well, I don't want to. That's a bad word, but. Uh, trying to convince the government to disclose what they know and the continuing public efforts of the, the very many public uh, organizations that uh, had been developed in each country worldwide throughout the years. Canada was no exception. So uh, again, uh, uh, mentioning and bringing uh, in these uh, very famous people, I want to mention one other uh, uh, ufologist Christopher Stiles who did a lot of seminal work with the Shag Harbor incident and helped uh, bring the subject of ufology and ET and extraterrestrial intelligence into the public consciousness and the public culture in Canada. So he's another um, another person. Peter Millman is actually an, uh, an additional person uh, uh, who was part of Project Second Study uh, second story, I'm sorry, back in the 1950s, he was an astronomer at the Dominion Observatory. So there's a scientist who was uh, kind of like uh, J. Allen Hynek was in the U.S., uh, studying the phenomenon with a high degree of skepticism, but throughout time that skepticism kind of uh, was worn away or whatnot. So uh, all of these important people helped develop and shape the history, at least uh, the early history, and continued on into today of the uh, Canada involvement with the uh, government uh, UFO, UAP files, disclosures, and whatnot. So uh, let's fast forward to uh, what the efforts were uh, more into modern times. So um, uh, the, the Civil Air Daily Occurrence Reporting System, or acronym KDORS, uh, was developed uh, in Canada uh, in the 1980s as a mechanism for commercial pilots 
to be destigmatized in terms of their UFO, UAP witness encounters and the reporting thereof. Uh, there was a very high stigma that was present back then where a commercial pilot did not want to report incidences of what they saw uh, when they were flying their, uh, their air jets. And uh, this KDOR's uh, 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 protocol helped to destigmatize and encourage pilots to actually file reports. This is one of the oldest uh, uh, reporting systems for uh, professional pilots, members of uh, the public uh, uh, community, so to speak, in terms of coming forward and reporting and adding to the um, UAP reporting uh, documentation. So, um, two very important uh, archives and websites exist that contain many of the Canadian disclosed documentation uh, catalogs set so to speak. The first one is the Library and Archives Canada uh, which helps Canadians gain a better understanding of, of uh, this uh, UFO UAP phenomena. Uh, it uh, contains 346 uh, archives of, of various uh, UFO reports uh, that have been disclosed from either various government agencies or uh, public um, public uh, uh, reporting uh, uh, agencies or organizations also, such as uh, MUFON Canada and others, a couple that I will mention. But um, there are uh, uh, contained, there's a 632 item library contained in the Library and Archives Canada. And, and there's case studies that go back uh, into the 1850s reported of uh, the UFO UAP phenomena. So Library and Archives Canada is one of the uh, facilities. The other one is the one that the uh, the, the hardcore one that the uh, Canada government actually uh, utilized to disclose and it's um, they're located on archive.org uh, details Canada UFO. Uh, as I mentioned uh, in, in uh, uh, other videos in my series, I'm going to be posting the websites locations on my Humaniverse Facebook page. So uh, please, I refer you over to there to get the website locations and then you can take your deep dives into the various companies uh, or various countries uh, activities and reports and documents and things like that. So. Um, other websites that uh, I'll be posting on there, uh, if for benefit of uh, Canada's involvement, is the Nat National Research Council, the NRC, and um, uh, other sites to be very, become very aware of in terms of disclosure. A lot of the Canada's disclosures uh, from archive that are available at archive.org and the Library and Archives Canada, uh, they only became uh, their efforts came to fruition in uh, roughly 2018. Uh, Canada made their uh, official announcements and disclosures of um, uh, in the archives.org there are over 8,000 pages of documents so very substantial indeed very significant so uh, Canada is uh, on uh, has joined the club of the world governments that have had meaningful disclosures unfortunately there are still many thousands of more uh, undisclosed documents that for various reasons and using various strategies for preventing disclosure, uh, freedom of information, to, to, to thwart freedom of information acts and whatnot, uh, Canada's government is uh, kind of doing the same thing here. But uh, let me mention, I'll mention a couple of uh, civilian uh, public sites. The, uh, the um, uh, Communications Instructions Reporting Vital Intelligence Sighting Systems or Service is one of those uh, that contains uh, a lot of documentation. Uh, again, uh, re regarding uh, Canadian military, uh, more important than just the general public, but um, that's uh, certainly the service is certainly another area. CIRVIS, where uh, Canadian uh, information and archives can be found. And uh, another site uh, is located, uh, the New Force site. 
Northern Ontario UFO Research and Study uh, site. It's called New Fours is the acronym. And uh, this, this organization has been running since the very early 1990s. Now, Michelle Deschamps is the director of the Northern Ontario UFO Research and Study uh, site here, New Force. Um, that uh, contains many, many thousands of uh, not only Canada, but worldwide articles uh, and uh, data and information uh, taken uh, from the U.S. and around the world uh in terms of the entire subject of ufology and uh, our more critical inspections here of uh, disclosures documents uh, freedoms of information and uh, things like that so uh within uh, within the new force site you'll even find uh, direct links to the u.s's central intelligence agency the cia which has uh, in the last couple of uh of years uh, for those of uh, my viewers that reside outside the United States the CIA has uh, done uh, performed a little bit of disclosure activity uh, again lots uh, remains to, to be desired in that area too but um, uh, so but other sites uh, in Canada that uh, that uh, maintain uh, archives and uh, informational resources uh, in addition to new for uh, new force uh, there's other groups uh, MUFON the mutual UFO network uh, has a Canada division and uh, my uh, friend Stu Bundy uh, has been a longtime director of Canada's efforts so that's the uh, public reporting system where uh, you, uh, you Canadian citizens, uh, if you have uh, incidences or witness uh, witness uh, encounters, uh, MUFON is the source to report, and you will get investigators out to to help you out there. But uh, other other uh, sites uh, with uh, other Canadian-based uh, UFO groups, UFO BC, British Columbia, and the uh, the Western region of Canada, HBCC UFO site is another one. Uh, Alberta, uh, the province of Alberta, has its own UFO research group, and a couple in uh, Quebec in uh, Eastern Canada, OVNI Expert, which is a uh, for our French-speaking citizens uh, in Canada, uh, it's uh, a, a bilingual, but uh, primarily uh, communicated and uh, broadcast and published in French. In French, and the Association of OVNI au Québec, which is another. French language uh, UFO UAP reporting agency. So, um, more recent, there has been a couple, a little more rumblings from the uh, Canada government uh, this past a year or so in March. Uh, they did release under Freedom of Information Act, uh, Canada's uh, version of it, uh, 300 pages of uh, uh, UFO UAP encounters, mostly by pilots, the military, and the police, uh, those various witnesses of those professions who had had experiences and came forward. There's about 300 pages uh, disclosed, and they'll be located on, I believe, the archive.org website. So this just happened in March of uh, this past year, 2022. And uh, a further, uh, more recent announcement on June the 6th in 2022 that uh, the uh, government uh, expects more uh, documents to be disclosed. They're using the explanation that uh, because the uh, locations of uh, documentation resides across many agencies. They say that the it's very complex to be able to pull out, extract the information, study it, approve it, and then actually disclose it. So uh, again, as I move towards the conclusions, this behavior is similar uh, to uh, what we've experienced in uh, New Zealand and uh, have experienced in many other world governments in terms of their strategies for uh, disclosure of files or the continued cover-up of files. And uh, mentioning that, there is an estimated that there are still well over 10,000 non-disclosed files within the Canadian government that reside in the National Archives in Ottawa 
that's only a guess, but uh, it's it's estimated many more than 10,000. So um, again, the takeaway is that uh, there is meaningful. I've read through some of these documents uh, that Canada has provided. It's a very meaningful, informative disclosure. It's a start. There's a long way to go. So with that, I will uh, sign off and uh, conclude uh, this study of the Canada's uh, World Government UFO Disclosures. Uh, thanks very much and uh, keep tuning in for my other uh, installments in the series of World Government UFO Disclosure. Thank you.